Welcome back. One of the most common questions that I get from my students is, how much can I expect my SAT or ACT score to improve? Well, it depends. I once heard another tutor say this adage, which I thought summed things up nicely. Infinite effort does not yield infinite rewards on a standardized test. That's not meant to be pessimistic, but rather honest and pragmatic. My primary goal as a tutor is to keep my students motivated to work hard towards their best possible scores. And I've seen many of my students earn some remarkable score increases. Still, there comes a point when the numbers will plateau. So in this video, let's talk about what some reasonable expectations are for potential score increases and why the numbers might plateau. This might seem a little on the Debbie Downer side, but I promise that my next video will be more optimistic. In that video, I'll talk about how you can earn more points no matter where you are in the scoring curve. So if this video leaves you feeling a little deflated, be sure to check that one out. And if you find this at all helpful, please hit that like button, share, and subscribe to the channel. Okay, let's talk about what score jumps you can reasonably expect to see on the SAT and the ACT. I'm going to start by reiterating that point from a moment ago. Infinite effort does not yield infinite rewards on a standardized test. My clients sometimes think that their scores will increase on a linear trajectory. For example, if we work together for a few months, we might bump a score of 1000 up to a real test score of 1200, which is not easy to do. But then they figure if they just keep working, they could bump that number to a 1350 or a 1400. Well, not necessarily. Whenever I hear a test prep company promise a certain score jump, like a 200 point increase on the SAT or a 5 point increase on the ACT, I'm skeptical. Be cautious when you hear that sort of guarantee. Just for context, I'll start with a good story. I once had a student starting with PSAT numbers in the 900s. We worked hard leading into the October 2018 SAT. On that test, he scored an 1190. Already, those jumps were huge, but he wanted to continue. So we kept working, and on the March 2019 test, he scored a 1370. So, will certain students see continual increases? Yes. Will everyone? Absolutely not. Let's look at the other side of the spectrum for a moment. A few years ago, I was about to start with a student whose baseline ACT scores were in the teens. The mother stressed how she wanted him to score above a 31. I told her that those were very lofty goals. She was not happy with me for saying that. But I told her before we started, I just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page in terms of realistic score expectations. After a respectful back and forth, we agreed that I was not the right match for him, so we did not work together. I'm not sure how he finally did. If he ended up jumping from the teens up to a 32, I give him all the credit in the world. But going from the teens into the 30s on the ACT is virtually unheard of. Just one more anecdote for context. Another student I had took the June 2016 ACT before I came along. He scored a 19. We started working together that summer, and on the September ACT, he jumped to a 25. Huge. I'll take a six-point jump any day. Now here's the fun part. This student was accused of cheating by the powers that be at the ACT. The case was eventually settled, and he happily went to college with his 25, but it's worth noting that even a six-point jump was already raising flags with the test maker, and many of my students hope for score jumps even higher than that. Now, I have seen some of my students go up nine or even ten points on specific ACT sections, but for a full composite score to go up that much, that is, suffice it to say, not the norm. So all I'm saying is that it's important to have realistic expectations before you start the process. Hope for the best and work hard, but realize that the numbers will plateau at a certain point. So the question is, why do the numbers plateau? And how can you avoid that? Let's get into it. The first thing to realize is that the SAT and the ACT are not designed for perfect scores. It's not like a high school chemistry test where if everyone just studies the material enough, then everyone can score above a 90. These tests don't work that way. This is because of the standard deviation curve and the way that the scores are distributed. A standard deviation curve looks like this. The majority of scores will be somewhere in the middle. And then from there, fewer and fewer students score closer to the ends. This is exacerbated all the more by the curve. In the middle of that score distribution, the curve is very kind. But once you get to the top of the curve, it'll penalize you much more. For example, on a recent SAT, a student who missed only four math questions would have lost 90 points. That is much harsher than the middle of the curve, where missing four questions might only account for a deduction of 20 points. 
Likewise on the ACT. Sometimes, in the reading and science sections, missing only two questions can lose you up to four points. Ouch! In the middle of the curve, missing two questions might lose you only one or two points. So as you start to score higher and higher, the curve will be less forgiving. Also, the higher you score, the less low-hanging fruit you have available to you. What do I mean by that? Let's say that you have an ACT English score of 22. This means that you have many gimme points coming from the easier topics, like semicolons or apostrophes. But once you get into the high 20s, and certainly above a 30, then you're no longer missing the questions that are based on just rules. Rather, you're missing the questions that are based on editing and organization. These points are based on comprehension and not knowledge. Same thing with math. Let's say that you have a 530 math score on the SAT. That means you have a lot of potential points coming from some of the easier topics, like isolating a variable or factoring. But once you get above a 600, and certainly above a 650, it means you're cleaning up on the gimmies. The remaining questions are more about problem solving and less about knowledge. However, that doesn't mean that there are no points to gain. Again, check out my next video where I'll get into much more detail about what each part of the scoring curve means and where you could find your potential points. I'll put a link at the end of this video. It's a good bookend to this one. Here's another reason why your score might plateau on the ACT math section specifically. The ACT math is, frankly, a little unfair. Of the 60 questions, they get harder as they go. The first 45 will be standard fare. You'll see many of the same topics come up from test to test. But this is not the case for the last 15 questions, where they throw in topics that never appeared on the test before. So it's very difficult to anticipate what topics you need to study to earn those last few points. It's a little luck of the draw. To help with this, I made my video 30 here. In that video, I cover many of those random ACT math topics that only pop up once in a while, as well as some other great tips to get a perfect score on the ACT. Check it out. So for all the reasons we just went through, certain score jumps are more doable than others. So it's easier to see a four point jump on the ACT from a 19 to a 23 than it is from a 29 to a 33. Likewise on the SAT, where a 100 point jump is much more doable from, let's say, a 1050 to an 1150 than it is from a 1350 to a 1450. The higher your score, the more all of these factors start working against you. This helps to explain why the numbers will eventually hit a plateau. Now I know what you're going to say, but Daniel, my GPA is, insert number here, or but I take advanced English, or but I'm in the IB math class. I hear this from my clients every day. <laughs> Unfortunately, your high school classes have very little to do with how you might perform on the SAT or the ACT. The plain truth is that high schools don't cover this material. I've ranted about this in previous videos, but briefly, there is no perfect marriage between what you learn in high school and what is considered fair game on the SAT or the ACT. For example, many of my public school students have never learned this grammar material before. My private school students have never seen a fair amount of the math. GPAs are all well and good, but there are inevitably many gaps between what my students see in high school and what's considered fair game on these exams. And that's why I created this channel. So if what I just said was a bit of a shock, or a little too depressing for you, don't worry, you're in the right place. Check out my math playlist and my grammar playlist. You're bound to see topics there that you've never seen in school before. And these are the topics that will earn you the most points on the test. An extension of that is reading comprehension. It's another thing that doesn't come up in high school, but it's a major component on both exams. In high school, your English grade might be based on writing a research paper or a creative essay on Hamlet. But I have students who have told me, without sarcasm, that they've never read a book. So when they sit for the SAT or the ACT, they come across college level passages where they simply do not understand what they read. And if this sounds like you, again, you're in the right place. Check out my reading playlist as well. There's a lot of great strategies there to help you bump your verbal numbers. Another thing to think about is the problem solving nature of the questions. Many SAT and ACT questions will present material in ways that my students have never seen before. For example, in a high school math class, a student might get a lot of practice with isolating a variable or working with certain trigonometry formulas. But many SAT math questions want you to think more conceptually. One example is how to use an equation to model a real-world scenario. I covered this in video 27 here. Check it out. That's just one example of how the tests ask that you go beyond pure computation. The questions are more about critical thinking. Many of my students aren't used to this. And then there's grade inflation. 
This could be an entire video unto itself, but briefly, a few decades ago, C's and B's were the most common GPAs. Now, the majority of students apply to colleges with averages well over a 90 or A minus and above. This is compounded by how the grades are scaled up. Students in AP or IB classes might have their grades multiplied by a certain factor, so students who score in the 70s might have their numbers bumped to the 80s, or from the 80s into the 90s, etc. Their grades aren't a true reflection of how they might be struggling with a given topic. So long story short, your high school grades won't necessarily correlate with your potential SAT or ACT scores. There's very limited overlap between what you see in high school and what is fair game on the test. But again, I promise it's not all doom and gloom. That's why I created the channel. So get comfortable, grab a drink, and start watching through the videos. They are specifically written to help you bridge those gaps between what you've seen in high school and what you'll see on the tests. And let's not forget effort. My best students understand that their progress is not based on the time I spend with them to introduce them to the material, but rather the time that they put in between our sessions to master the material. Or as a colleague of mine once said, it's a number two pencil, not a magic wand. Practice is crucial. This is especially true when you factor in the stamina and the focus required to take the full test. Check out my video 24, here, where I talk about how to build a study plan. It outlines how to integrate studying and practice questions with full-length tests. So, think about where you're starting and what that means about potential score increases, rather than trying to reach a definitive number. For example, if you're starting in the upper teens on the ACT, you might shoot for a score somewhere in the mid-20s. But like the student I mentioned before, going from an 18 to a 31 is extremely unlikely. Likewise on the SAT and going perhaps from a 1000 to a 1200, but you're very unlikely to see that same 200 point jump from a 1300 to a 1500 for all of the reasons we covered before. Think about where you're starting in the scoring bracket and what that means about realistic jumps. Don't start the process thinking 1450 or bust, or I'm going to keep taking the ACT until I break the 30 mark. You might be setting yourself up for disappointment. That's why it's so important to take full length practice tests timed and in one sitting. Check out my video 6, where I talk about how to know when it's time to retire. In that video, I talk about how you can use your practice scores as a barometer for your real test scores. If your practice numbers show that you have the potential for more, then go for it. You can think about taking the test again. But if your real scores are in line with your best practice numbers, or far better than those numbers, you could think about retiring. So the bottom line is this. Work hard to see the best score jumps that you can, but also balance that with reasonable expectations about when the numbers might plateau. If you have any questions about this, be sure to leave it in the comments section below. And of course, utilize this channel to help with your score jumps. These lessons are designed to help you hit the best numbers that you can. And speaking of hitting your best numbers, check out my next video where I'll get into more details about how to improve your score. Whether you're looking to break a 1000 on the SAT or a 32 on the ACT, there are potential points in every part of the curve. I'll see you there. Thanks for watching. And remember, plan your work, work your plan.